Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. So we started discussing the calibration of our model. So we are here in this big section, discrete forward rate term structure model calibration. So the models we are considering are here models for the interest rate curve that model a discretized interest rate curve by modeling a family of forward rates, either in this version or that version. So we had a version here where the diffusion is written with independent Brownian increments. Yeah, so that has here factor loadings or where the diffusion is written with a Brownian increment DWI specific to the ice forward rate. And then we specify the correlation structure of these drivers of these DWIs. And I would like to continue discussing the correlation. So I already made a few remarks on the calibration of the correlation. So the interesting thing was that when we looked here at how to choose the volatility in one of the previous sessions, then we observed that actually the volatility function as it depends on time is very powerful. It can create by shifting volatilities, so the amplitude of the movements to different times, it can create terminal decorrelation so there is here the terminal correlation created from our instantaneous uh, volatility instead of using the instantaneous correlation. You know? So in contrast to using the instantaneous correlation, so which is our parameter uh, rho i j. So we can use the sigma to create terminal decorrelation or different terminal correlations, which allowed us to, for example, calibrate uh, swaptions. So my remark on the calibration of the correlation is that this correlation is then still a free parameter. And we can, for example, uh, make a choice to calibrate covariance structures on the swap rates. So the swap rate correlation. Um, or we could also choose the correlation to model observed movements yeah, from the past. Yeah, so use a, a historical estimate as an indication how we, how we could choose the correlation. So in our version of the model 109, we assumed that each forward rate Li is driven by its individual Brownian motion, WI. Um, so this means the correlation structure, DWI, DWJ, is modeled by rho ij dt. In this alternative version, we used independent Brownian increments, DUJ, and of course, between the two, there's the, is, is a link. So if I uh, specify now with the factor loadings FIJ, DUJ, summed over all factors, J from one to M, the Brownian motion, yeah, this means that the DWI should be equal to sum FIJ, DUJ. Yeah, so, so that means uh, the correlation matrix rho ij is actually given by the scalar product between fi being the ith row of my matrix f and fj being the j's row of my matrix f. Also, I mentioned that for uh, calibration, it is sometimes helpful 
to reduce the number of free parameters. So we had here a large number of parameters. Actually, this is a function. Yeah, so it's a matrix of functions. And we could just say, okay, we'd like to reduce the whole correlation structure to a single parameter. So there were uh, functional forms. We also had functional forms, for example, for the volatility and a very easy popular functional form is here this exponential decay. So that means if you have the interest rate curve uh, given by say some uh, forward rates, okay, these are here the forward rates, then forward rates that are closer to each other, for example, this guy and that guy here, they are highly correlated. So if this guy, uh, moves up yeah so then maybe that guy here also moves up maybe a little less yeah so there is some independence but if they are further away yeah so say now also the blue guy and the red guy then maybe there is some in more independence so this one could for example then move a little bit down yeah so that you get more independent movements if you are uh, further away yeah so that is a little bit like you think that there are strings connecting the interest rates yeah and they are tight a little bit uh, tighter together to uh, if they are uh, closer to each other so that is um, a nice uh, model model within the model to model the correlation structure we also observed that sometimes it is good to reduce the number of factors. Yeah. If we have 40 interest rates, we could have 40 individual Brownian motions, but um, there are, yeah, okay, I have a remark later on that, there are uh, arguments to reduce uh, the number of factors. Okay, so that is um, what I would like to do with you uh, today to actually discuss how do we choose now the matrix F? So these factors that are in front of the independent Brownian drivers. So I have a given correlation matrix, for example, my exponentially decaying correlation matrix. So this guy gives me my rho ij but when I like to build the model, well, how do you create correlated Brownian increments? Yeah, that's maybe not so clear, but you know how to create independent Brownian increments because you have a random number generator that allows you to sample independent increments. So you know how to generate the use, but you do not know how to generate the W. So what I would like to know is how do I get to the factors f i k yeah, if i have a given correlation matrix so that's one question but another question is if you have a correlation model modeled for example by um, a functional form so let's take the one we had previously we have more decorrelation if the fixing of forward rates is further away is this a correlation matrix? Well, that's maybe not immediately clear. Yeah, okay, the diagonal is one, obviously, but is there maybe some property that has to be fulfilled in addition by a correlation matrix? So if one element has a correlation of 0 0.5 with another element, and that other element has a correlation with 0 0.2 with a third element. So is there some constraint between the first one and the last one? Yeah. So of course, maybe they don't, they are not allowed to have correlation one. Yeah? So is this um, a correlation model matrix? And if it is not a correlation matrix, what can we do to use such a functional form to define a correlation matrix. So that second question is also answered by our um, today's uh, session on factor decomposition. And we also answer a third 
part, factor reduction. So once we have decomposed uh, the number of factors, can we reduce this model to a model with smaller number of factors? Let's call them FIK superscript R, R for reduced, the reduced factor set. So that means this here is maybe the set of full factors. And this here is the set of reduced factors. I just have M factors. So how do we perform this reduction? If I would like to have a correlation model that has just a reduced number of these factors, so I do not like to use so many independent Brownian drivers. So we will discuss all these three aspects uh, today. So we consider our model. So that was the version 109, the one that has here the Brownian driver separately for each forward rate and then has the correlation model. We consider this one in this alternative form, 109 star. So that's the one where we have independent Brownian increments composed together with some factor loadings. Well, these factor loadings, lambda IK, they contain the volatility function and our FIK. So actually the important thing is that we have this decomposition DWI is my FIK DUK. So I consider this in this um, alternative form. So I have that DWI is the sum FIK DUK, where DUK DUL is uh, zero, no? zero DT for K not equal L. Yeah? So these are independent increments. There is already a condition I can observe I have that D W I D W I is D T. So the correlation of D W I with itself is one, the instantaneous correlation. So it's one D T. So if you plug in now this definition and use that all the cross terms cancel. So this means that FIK times FIK, so FIK squared, summed over all those factors we use here has to be one. Yeah? So this one here is just the rho II. Yeah? So the rho II, this is uh, one. So if you think of the Fs being in a matrix, where uh, the K are the column. So this means that the norm of the rows are uh, one. So my task is now given a correlation matrix R, I would like to know how do I generate the DW vector? So the correlated Brownian increments from the independent Brownian increments. So from the increments du. So what I would like to do is how do I determine the Fi case? I will discuss this for the uh, infinitesimal Brownian increments, the dw, the du. But of course, this uh, derivation also then holds for the time discrete increment. Yeah, so it also carries over to the time discrete increments delta w. Yeah, by just doing the, uh, the Euler scheme, you freeze uh, the correlation matrix for a time step. And of course, then you also freeze the factor matrix for that time step. So that's already here the answer, our little lemma, the factor decomposition. So given a 
correlation matrix R, how do I get the factors F I K? So first observation, if R is a correlation matrix, then R is symmetric and positive semi-definite. So R is symmetric and positive semi-definite. Um, there is the stand because this is a part that maybe I have to prove, yeah? Okay, so that it is symmetric is ob obvious, but that it is uh, positive semi-definite, maybe I have to prove this. If this is the case, then this implies that R has only real eigenvalues. So we have that R has only real eigenvalues. And from the positive semi-definite, I know that all these eigenvalues are larger or equal than zero. Okay, so let's call them lambda one to lambda n and assume that these are ordered. Yeah, so this is just my convention of the indexing. Yeah, lambda one is the largest eigenvalue, lambda n is the smallest eigenvalue. In addition, there is um, a corresponding autonormal basis of eigenvectors. So let's call these v1 to vn. And this means I can yeah, look at the matrix in this basis of eigenvectors. And there, the correlation matrix is diagonal. So I can diagonalize the matrix. So my correlation matrix R multiplied from the left with V transposed from the right with V. So V transposed R, V is the diagonal matrix lambda one to lambda n. So that's just the definition that V is an eigenvector, yeah? R, V, I is lambda I, V, I. Okay, so since this here is an orthonormal basis, yeah? so I assume that these guys are uh, normalized, I also have that V transposed V is the identity. Yeah? So the norm of each of these guys is one, so a column times a column is equal to uh, one if it is the same column or it is zero if it is two different columns. So V transposed V is the identity. This means that V transposed is the inverse of V. So multiplying from the left with V, this guy is canceling. I get a V here, multiplying from the right with V transpose, this guy here is canceling and I get a V transpose here. So in addition, I get that R can be represented as V times D times V transpose. Okay, so that's just basic linear algebra, but now I have my factor matrix F. Because what I can do now is that since all my eigen values are large or equal zero, the square root of lambda i is real. Okay, so I can look at the matrix square root of d, and I can decompose the matrix r to v square root of d square root of d V transposed. Yeah, but since D is a diagonal matrix, you could also write here a transposed. And you see, if you now define this guy here as being F, this is just F times F transposed. So my claim is now that with this matrix, F, if I now define W as F times 
du, where f is the matrix v, every column is an eigenvector, multiplied with square root of d, the matrix where we have the square root of the eigenvalues on the diagonal, multiplied with du, then dw is an n-dimensional Brownian motion with the given correlation structure. So dwi, dwj is rho ij dt. So in matrix notation, it's a bit nicer. Yeah. So I define my factor matrix F is multiply every eigenvector with the square root of the eigenvalue, take these as the columns of this matrix, and then you have that dw being equal to f times du is an n-dimensional Brownian motion where ff transpose gives you the correlation matrix R. Okay, so there are two then here. Yeah? So maybe this thing has to be proven. Yeah? If R is a correlation matrix, it is symmetric and positive semi-definite. Um, so this other part here is then just basic linear algebra. Okay, and then there is here the claim that this definition of the Brownian motion W is the one that I would like to have. So it is a Brownian motion with instantaneous correlation. Ah, so this little lemma tells me how we construct um, our correlated Brownian increments DWI from the uncorrelated Brownian increments DUK. So for the proof, yeah, obviously my correlation matrix is symmetric. So this is okay. Thus all, all eigenvalues are real. So what I need to show is that the eigenvalues remain large or equal zero. So if R is a correlation matrix, say for example, from some random variable x, yeah, some random vector x, x1 to xn, where all entries have variance one and expectation uh, zero, then this means R is the yeah, definition of now the covariance matrix, which is because the variance is equal to one, then equal to the correlation matrix. So then the R is just the expectation of X times X transposed. Yeah? So X is a column vector. So X times X transposed means that every element of the vector X is multiplied with every other element of the vector X. And this builds a matrix, yeah? XI times XJ. So I take the expectation of XI times XJ. And that's just the row ij, you know, since this is the variance because the expectation is zero, and it is the correlation because the variance is one. Now let vi denote an eigenvector of my correlation matrix as before, and lambda i, the corresponding eigenvalue. Then I can look what is the variance of x, the vector, projected in the direction of vi. Yeah? So x is some vector yeah, that makes different movements. And I now look just in the direction vi. So this means I look here to x transposed vi. So actually the scalar product of x and vi squared. Yeah? So the norm. This I can write as vi transposed times x multiplied with x transposed vi. Since vi is just a constant vector, 
I can move it out of the expectation. So I just have the correlation matrix there inside. VI transposed from the left, VI from the right. VI is um, an eigenvector, so RVI is just lambda I, VI. So what I have is that this is just lambda I, VI squared, you know, the norm of VI. So you see on the left-hand side is something positive, on the right-hand side is something positive, VI. Yeah, on the right-hand side, I have lambda I VI, but VI is also something positive. So lambda I has to be uh, positive or say non-negative. So if you divide by the norm of VI, you have that your lambda I is just this projected variance in the direction of VI divided by the norm of VI. And this is larger or equal zero. So that was the second part of my first then in this little lemma. So now I have eigenvalues larger or equal zero, and I can take the square root of lambda i. So this means that now my, my dw is well defined. So last step, check that dw is the correlated Brownian motion, correlated Brownian increment we are looking for. So this is our f. So dw, dw transpose, dw is the vector of the Brownian increments, it's a column vector, dw times dw transpose is every element of the dw vector multiplied with every other element of the dw vector, yeah, so row times column. It's element by element. So it is the matrix DWI, DWJ, which I have here on the left-hand side. This matrix, plug in the definition. So this is V square root of D, DU, DU transposed, square root of D transposed V transposed. So you plug this in here, yeah, and you get one part here and the other part there. Reversed order because of the transposed. But I have that DU, DU is identity DT. So DUI, DUJ is equal to one if I is equal to J, otherwise it is zero. So this is identity DT. So the DT can be moved to the end here. And I just have V square root of D square root of D V transpose. So I have my correlation matrix R back. So it is R DT. Yeah, very nice little lemma. You just need to do the eigenvalue decomposition of the correlation matrix and you have immediately the factor matrix F. The factor matrix F is square root of the eigenvalue multiplied with the corresponding eigenvector as the columns. Now from that, we can answer the next part. How can we reduce the number of factors? And to understand what we are doing, maybe we go back to the lemma and have a closer look to the matrix F here. F times du means that you take a column of F and multiply it with du1. You take the second column of F and multiply it with du2 and so on. And this column is then the movement of the interest rate curve. So every column here describes a movement of the interest rate curve. 
So the elements of the vector V describes how each forward rate is moving. Is it moving up or down? Yeah. Is V11 a plus one? And is V12 a minus one? So then one guy is moving up, the other guy is moving down. If the random number we generate here, if the du is positive, otherwise it goes exactly in the opposite direction. Yeah, so that guy moves maybe up and that guy moves down. Then V is a normal lysed vector. So it is just the shape of the movement, but not the strength. The strength of the movement is the eigenvalue. Yeah? So is this a strong movement in this direction or is it a not so strong movement of this direction? Of course, every such movement is multiplied then with a standard normal, yeah, multiplied with square root of time step size. But that's just for every such column, the same random movement that is then, yeah, or the same amplitude of the random movement that is then multiplied with this column. So maybe we have a good understanding and we will do uh, understand this better if we look then at it and our numerical experiments. But maybe we have already a good understanding of the matrix F. So this is somehow the shape and this is the amplitude of the movement in our interest rate curve. So my eigenvalues were ordered. So if lambda describes how, it, how strong the movement is, maybe I can just reduce the number of factors by throwing away a few such guys. So instead of saying that dwi is my sum k from 1 to n, so now comes my factor here, fik duk, Maybe we could just throw away some guys and just take the first M movements. So this here is a square root of lambda I multiplied with a VIK. So I just take FIK for the first K from one to M. Use that to generate the brown increment and throw away the remaining part. So is this maybe a good idea to perform some kind of reduction, throwing away the remaining parts because these guys are small or say smaller because if I K is square root lambda i vik. Vi is a unit vector, and we have that the lambda i's are ordered. So maybe these guys here are the smaller ones, and we just throw them away. We already had a reason to reduce the number of factors. And one reason given was the evaluation of the drift. So the evaluation of the drift can be performed much faster if we have a low number of factors. So the evaluation of the drift is order n times m. So instead of using n factors, yeah, where we get an n squared, I get with m factors, I get an n times m. So if I reduce now from 40 factors for 40 interest rate to say five factors, yeah, I just get an improvement, which is a factor of eight which is a big improvement in the performance. So that's one argument that the correlation matrix should have a small uh, rank. Uh, number of non-zero um, eigenvalues uh, is the rank of the matrix, should have a small rank. 
maybe for us as a modeler, this is not a good argument, yeah, because okay, it, it just makes the computer code faster, but maybe it degrades the quality of the model. Uh, on the other hand, also as a modeler, I would like to have a computer model to be fast because then I can do a lot of experiments and get a good intuition for the model. Uh, you know, the, the the feedback is is, is higher. Yeah? So sometimes I also, as a modeler, uh, like to have a very fast uh, performant uh, model. But there are also other arguments. So apart from that, the rank also determines how many independent random variables we have to sample. So the rank of the correlation matrix also determines how many independent random variables we have to sample. Yeah, you just see that here there are only m different du, m different uh, increments. So the vector u that I need to sample has length m instead of length n, uh, if I also take the other components. So the length of the vector for which I have to sample random numbers, it's much shorter. Uh, so you can think of this as being, yeah, these are the independent increments. So it is the number of independent dimensions. This is the di dimension of my random vector. So you have a lower dimensional random vector you have to sample. And this is an important um, aspect because random number generators, they become poorer in high dimensions. Yeah? And I have a factor of eight difference in the dimension of the random vector which I have to sample. Maybe just as a reminder, recall that in numerical methods, there was a small remark how you create a random vector. So that here is now my random vector, which I have to sample. You can create, create this from a sequence of one-dimensional random variables. So I assume that the random vector has IID Uh, components. So then I can take just a sequence of IID random variables and I just generate the vector using this rule. Okay, this rule looks complicated, but it's just that you populate the vector from a one dimensional sequence where you walk here along one by the other. Though. So that fills the first one, the second one, that fills the third one, that fills the fourth one, and so on. So you populate the vector. So you so you also see that you need factor eight fewer random numbers in your one-dimensional random sequence to generate the sequence of the um, random vector now, if the random vector has factor eight lower dimension. Okay, so there is um, also that um, argument. This is now not performance, it's numerical um, accuracy. The random number generators, they degrade in quality if the number of dimension is high yeah, or if the sequence becomes uh, very, very low, uh, long. So hence, we have actually multiple uh, motivations to reduce the rank of the factor matrix of the correlation matrix to reduce the number of factors. And we already have an idea what we do. We just throw away the factors that belong to small eigenvalues. And that's the factor reduction. So I just used the previous construction of my Brownian motion with the same notation. Yeah? So correlation matrix R, V is the matrix where the columns are the eigenvectors, D is the matrix where the diagonal are the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues are ordered. So I had that D is the diagonal matrix lambda one, two, lambda n with lambda 1 being the largest 
and lambda n being the smallest eigenvalue. My factor matrix F is given by V times square root of D. So now I define the uh, reduced factor matrix, say F superscript R, by taking an N times M matrix, where I just throw away the columns M plus one to N of the matrix F. So I just have here the elements from my matrix F, which is lambda I times VI in the column. So maybe I, I denote this column with F dot one, F dot two, and so on. And then I have F dot M. And I just throw away the columns F dot M plus one to F dot N. Huh? These, are, these are the columns that I throw away. So I have an N times M matrix here. Okay, but now there is an issue. Recall that here I mentioned that the norm of the row of the norm of the row is row i i for the ice row is equal to one. And you also see this here. You have that dwi dwi is one dt. So the instantaneous variance is one dt. If you throw away movements, you reduce the variance. You have lost variance. So while here we have the sum from k equals one to n, if i k squared is equal to one, I'm now throwing away parts. So maybe I make this guy smaller. If I just take the sum f i k squared k from one to n. Now, so if this is not by chance here a zero, then I've thrown away something. I've thrown away movements. I've thrown away variance in my well candidate for the DWI. So it's not so easy, yeah? So I cannot just leave some factors away. So I have to fix this. And I fix this by renormalization. So my true definition of the matrix F superscript R, my reduced factor matrix, is that Fik superscript R is this original factor Fik renormalized such that the norm of this n times m matrix rho is again one. Yeah, so I just divide by the square root yeah of the norm of this rho. So of the ice rho. So this means I calculate my uh, reduced factor matrix by first step taking the matrix where I just leave out some columns and then renormalize uh, the end rows. Now I have my reduced factor matrix F superscript R and I then define my yeah, Brownian increment with the reduced Factor. So actually, maybe I should have also here a superscript R on top, if you like, by taking F superscript R du. And this is then an n dimensional m factorial Brownian motion. Yeah? n dimensional 
because dw is an n vector. So I have n rows. But this n vector is generated from only m Brownian motions. So the factor reduction is just the principal component analysis, yeah, eigenvalue decomposition, followed by um, a renormalization of the components, yeah, where you take the most prominent components driving your, your model. Interpretation, yeah, I already mentioned this interpretation as a motivation. The magnitude of the eigenvalue, so my lambda r, my lambda. K defines somehow the um, importance of the corresponding factor. The factor FK defines a little bit the shape. Yeah? So in which direction is this movement um, observed? And we used this to reduce the number of factor to decide which factor is then important in our factor reduction. Yeah, let's look at the simple example. A simple example is the limit case of a perfect correlation. So if you have a perfect correlation, how does this look like? Perfect correlation means that my correlation matrix, okay, correlation matrix has always one on the diagonal, but now every dwi has perfect correlation with every other dwj, so I have ones everywhere. So what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix? Well, obviously an eigenvector is the vector one, one, and so on, one. Okay, if I multiply this vector with this matrix, I get n times V1. So my eigenvalue is lambda one equals n. So now my eigenvector is not not, yeah? In my lemma, I had an orthonormal basis to norm this vector. I have to divide this one divided by square root of n. So this means my factor f dot one. So the first column of my factor matrix is square root of lambda, so square root of n times one divided by square root of n. Okay, so this cancels times the vector that has one in every entry. So my factor is really, yeah, the horizontal line. Yeah, if you now plot the entry for every forward rate, forward rate on the x-axis, vertical axis is the factor. So the rows are the entries for the DWIs. So I have that dwi, every row gets the same one. And there's just one column. It is just the one times the du1. So I did the correlated guys in this color. Yeah, so maybe dwi is one du1. So all forward rates get the same movement, but now we have a much nicer interpretation. So I have a single driver du1 that is creating the noise and all the guys get the same shape added. And this is just the parallel shift, yeah? The vector that is one in every element. So this is a nice interpretation. So. This matrix R I have here has rank uh, one. So I have the eigenvalue N corresponding to the eigenvector V1. Okay, this guy not being the normalized eigenvector. The other guys 
are zero, so I have an n minus one fold eigenvalue zero. Yeah, so you could think that there is here just a plus sum from k to k equals two to n zero times d u k. Yeah, so these are here the guys that belong to that guy which we do not need to sample, which we do not need to generate. This is our example for the one factor model. Let's have a look how these guys look for say our correlation model. So I, I have here a correlation model rho i j, and then I do the factor decomposition for uh, this matrix. And I have a few figures here in the script, but we could also look into this in the code. So here in our um, experiment repository, uh, you find a package called um, experiments factor reduction. And there is a small experiment factor matrix experiment, which just does these steps. So I create a correlation matrix and my correlation matrix is associated with uh, an interest rate model, which has a time discrete forward rate structure associated with a tenor discretization. So there is a time discretization here, but this time discretization, yeah, actually it's not really needed. It's just because here in my model, um, actually, we later have ti minus tj. Okay, have a ti minus tj, yeah, but you see my time step is equal to one. So uh, actually ti is just the i. Yeah, create a correlation matrix from functional form. So let's have a look at this implementation. It comes here below, create correlation from functional form. This is our model exponential minus A times absolute value Ti minus Tj. So if two forward rates are further away, further apart, they have more decorrelation. So that's my model for the rho ij. So I have the time discretization and I have this parameter A, which describes the decorrelation, the exponential decay. So I just calculate here exponential of minus a, and then take the difference of the two times, yeah, ti minus tj, where i is the row of the matrix and j is then the column of the matrix. So this gives my matrix, um, OIJ, yeah, so I just return here this, this matrix. So we have built a correlation matrix. And then I call here my function. Okay, this is just linear algebra. Just perform a factor reduction to say a given number of factors or perform a factor reduction to say just the full set um, of factors. And then I just plot these two factor matrices. So this here is my n times n matrix. So this is the F. Yeah? So these are the matrix F here. Um, and this here is the reduced matrix, my F superscript R. So this is my n times m matrix. The number of factors is specified here. So there are here two small parameters I can I can I can play with and we will see a plot of both uh, matrices. So there is some code here that plots this and that's that's it. Okay, so there are a few helper functions that transform this uh, factor matrix then to something that can be plotted, yeah, to some uh, function, okay, but I'm just taking the element of the matrix at uh, the given time point. So the horizontal line is the time point. So it is the parameter i in my fik, and uh, the uh, vertical point is the size of the fik, and we will see factors for different k's. Yeah, so we will see the f dot k 
functions. Yeah, let's run, run this uh, little program. So you see my parameters are three factors. Exponential decay is 0, 0, 0,05. Yeah, you see this is here the full factor matrix. The red line is the largest factor. They are already ordered by the eigenvalues. The green one is the second largest. The blue one is the third largest. And the other guys are then the other ones. So this is the square root of lambda i times vi. So this is the f, um, yeah, ik we see here. And if we now perform the factor reduction, I get the picture uh, on the left. Okay, and what is going on here? So, is this the picture we had? I don't know, I see my, my parameter in the script is here a little bit smaller, I have in 0 0.05. So maybe let's also take this parameter here. Let's do the same experiment again with a smaller exponential decay. Smaller exponential decay means higher correlation and we get this picture. So right-hand side, the full factor matrix, left-hand side, the reduced matrix re reducing to three factors. So let's discuss this picture a little bit. So this guy here is the factor fi1. Yeah, so this here is the, the i corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. So you see, it is almost like in a one-factor model. No? So this would be, if it would be equal to one. So it is a model that has a very high correlation. So my exponential decay here is small. Uh, so it's almost like exponential of zero. Everything is equal to, to one. So there are a few other factors left here. This is the second one. And this is the third. The factors have interpretations. Yeah, Like in the one factor model where we saw that I have just a parallel movement. This guy is also responsible for the parallel movement. So all the interest rates will get the same movement. This guy is responsible for interest rates on one end go up, the other end goes down. So this is a tilt. Yeah. So if the random number is negative, it will go up on the short end and uh, it will go down on the short end and up on the long end. Uh, so it is the other way around. So the random number decides goes, uh, how it is tilting. So this is a tilt of the interest rate curve. And what's the blue one? Yeah, the blue one is moving the short end and the long end uh, up. Okay, and in the center, it goes down. So this is like bending, bending the interest rate curve. So maybe maybe you also find these three under the name, the level, uh, the tilt or the slope, level, slope, and curvature, bending, level, slope, and curvature are also com common names for th these three guys. Now we throw away all the black noise, okay, so the factors that have low amplitude, we throw it away. And what you observe is that there is a small change in the shape. Yeah? So if you look here, you see there is a small change in the shape, but it is small. Uh, well, this change in the shape, where does it come from? 
Okay, I just throw away the other guys. But I also do the renormalization. So I have the condition that this guy squared plus this guy squared plus this guy squared should be equal to one. Yeah? So the renormalization of my reduced factors, yeah, of course, changes the shape. So because this renormalizing factor is different for different eyes. Yeah? So I just measure for every eye how much variance is here inside these residual guys. Yeah? And you see, for example, the queen one is crossing the zero here. So if you would throw away the queen one, there would be maybe no rescaling factor here, but there would be a rescaling factor here. So the shape uh, changes a little bit, but the change is small. Okay, why it is small? Yeah, okay. What I have is that 0.4 squared is 0.16. 0.2 squared is 0 0.04. Uh, so these two together, yeah, they are still small, 0 0.2. Okay. So this this change that we have here is that this distance there is a square root of one minus uh, 0 0.2, yeah, a square root of 0 0.8. Okay, so this is here, this distance. In this distance, it's just these other guys here that, 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 that make a difference. So because there's the squared, it, uh, the, the change in the shape is still small. This looks different if we take a model which has low correlation. So you see this here is high correlation. If, High correlation means that my model is anyway very close to um, a one-factor model to a model where I just have this factor. So maybe if you like, we can go back to our code and set the correlation decay parameter, for example, to zero. Where you see I have my one factor model, it's just the parallel movement and all other factors are zero. This is the high correlation. So this is full correlation. This was high correlation. Maybe I make this parameter here a little bit larger, 0 0.05. And you now see that throwing away factor four, five, six, and so on, so all the higher ones and just keeping the first three ones makes maybe a bigger difference. Yeah, the shape is changing significantly uh, of these factors due to this renormalization. Okay, so in a setup with low correlation, say here the example 0 0.1 for our parameter, I see here a larger change. Yeah, the reason is that the other factors matter. Uh, how does the correlation matrix look like? So if you take these factors here and you build F times F transposed, you get back your correlation matrix R. If you take here the reduced matrix, so let's take superscript R for the reduced matrix and build F times F transposed, you get your reduced correlation matrix. 
how is now the relation between your original one and your reduced correlation matrix? Does it look very different? So here is the picture for the previous factors. Yeah, so this is the model with low correlation. Low correlation, I have a strong decaying parameter. So if you have here this decay parameter, 0 0.1, so this means you have here some kind of exponentially decaying function. So you see on the diagonal, you have here um, a one on the diagonal. Okay, so now I'm looking from the on uh, uh, on the top of the correlation matrix. Uh, so my rows are labeled from the bottom to the top. So my correlation matrix goes in in this slope. Actually, in this slope. Um, and here I have uh, zeros. Okay, so this is my original correlation matrix for this model here. And now I do the factor reduction. So I go from here to there to calculate the factors. I do the factor reduction, go from there to there. And now I recalculate the correlation matrix again, not just by taking my factor matrix reduced and multiply F with F transposed to get this reduced correlation matrix. And you see, of course, on the diagonal, you still have one. But, okay, I have thrown away some important factors. I do not decay as fast as in the previous model. And also, I do not have the nice shape that I uh, decay in every uh, direction in the same in the same way. Uh, so these two correlation matrix look quite different. So maybe you have thrown away too many too many factors. For you to play a little bit, I have a nice little toy. So in the same package here, where you have this experiment that just do, does this linear algebra, you also find some kind of uh, nice. Uh, applet. So you can run here this factor reduction and you get an applet that creates these pictures. Yeah, And maybe we step again through a few nice cases. So let's take the one factor model where I have here uh, exponential decay yeah, is a zero. So the whole matrix is uh, one. If you now create some decay, say 0 0.05, no? then my correlation matrix looks like that. So I have factors that are important. If I have a one factor model, it means I throw all of these away and I have a correlation matrix that is one everywhere and just has one factor. And now you can step through the number of factors and increase the number of factors. So you see, I add another factor. So this will change the shape, of course, here of the first factor. I have the condition that the sum of the green and the red one for every such column here, yeah. So then, actually, the in the matrix it is a, in the matrix it is the row. Every element squared, the sum has to be one. My renormalization. Yeah? So this is because this gives me the reason that the shapes here are different, but the behavior of the factors is similar. It is level and slope. Yeah. So. Um, the parallel shift and the tilt. If you increase the number of factors, you see that you get more factors on the right, the shapes become more similar. And also on the left, the correlation matrix is becoming more and more similar. And maybe five factors yeah, is already maybe yeah, a nice one. Um, you can also reduce the decay parameter here further. Yeah? So for example, like that. 
Okay, so you see this is a very high D correlation. It looks here all factors are important. And you also see here that uh, this matrix is still far away and you can increase the number of factors to become closer to this, to this, to, to this model. So I have also some of these guys in the script for some parameters. So just for reference, you can create the pictures here in the script with this experiment in our repository. And you can also run this little applet. Yeah, you can either run in your IDE this program, or you can also run it with uh, with Maven on the command line, and it will bring up this GUI where you can explore a little bit the factor reduction and the factors. So I like to conclude with um, a few remarks. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I will also point you to the code. I had a third question in the beginning, and this question was. Is this a correlation model if we choose, for example, such a functional form? So it may not immediately be clear if this specification, rho ij is exponential minus alpha ti minus tj, if this guy is an admissible correlation matrix. Well, the matrix is symmetric. This can be easily checked. But do we know that this matrix only has positive eigenvalues, eigenvalues larger or equal zero? Yeah, what we can do is an easy fix. We just do the factor decomposition. So we just check if the model generates negative eigenvalues and we just throw them away by taking the other factors and reconstruct a correlation matrix. So this is a very nice technique to ensure that any functional model generates a correlation matrix you do your factor reduction and you fix this problem by throwing away the yeah, components that generate uh, negative eigenvalues. Actually, my code does this. Then another subtle thing, yeah, so there is a subtle numerical issue in our construction. If vi is my eigenvector, my normed eigenvector, then minus vi is also one. So my model specification is not unique. Yeah. So we could have one, one, one as the one factor model. I could also have minus one, minus one, minus one as the one factor model. So if now my numerical algorithm generates sometimes this guy, sometimes that guy, he's generating actually the correct factor, but it is numerically not stable because sometimes the model is moving in this direction, sometimes the model is moving in that direction. From a mathematical point of view, this is no problem because we are multiplying here anyway with a random number. And this is a normal distributed random number. It is just, do we draw something positive or do we draw something negative? For the model, it's no difference. However, for the numerical error, it makes a difference because we somehow generate different random movement, different random numbers. So in many applications, it is essential that a numerical algorithm is robust, robust in the sense that a small parameter change does not flip the numerical error.
For this reason, I have in my code, for example, some convention, a convention that makes the choice of the eigenvectors unique. For example, the first element yeah, of the eigenvector should have a positive sign. Yeah? So this will distinguish the 111 from the minus 111. Next remark, the number of factors. I have a model where I um, reduce the number of factors to say M. M is now my desired number of factors, but it could be that my specification, for example, exponential minus alpha time difference suddenly has a rank that is smaller than M. For example, if alpha is zero, it is a one factor model. In that case, you are a little bit tempted to just use the first factors and do not use the other ones. Yeah? So you have a small change in the parameter and your model flips from an M factor model to an R factor model. But if you do this, this is a problem because this changes the random number sequence. Yeah, so, which results in a jump of the Monte Carlo error. So this is another implementation remark. You should keep the number of factors constant, even if there is, for example, a parameter that suddenly changes a factor loading to zero. And a last remark, also very nice. How close is the factor reduced matrix to the original one? Yeah. So performing the factor matrix, we might be concerned. Have we thrown away too much? And of course, this is an important question. You have to check that your model models the relevant movements relevant for your application. So if your financial product depends on the tilt of the interest rate curve, this factor should be part of your correlation model. So you should take this view of what are the possible movements of the curve. But with respect to calibration, it may be is not an issue if you reduce the number of factors and your reduced matrix is not close to the original one because you can view the correlation model, for example, your exponential minus alpha, ti minus tj, so your um, functional form, plus the reduction, you can view it as a single model. So we view the factor reduced correlation model as the correlation model. And we then calibrate the alpha such that the reduced matrix is improving the calibration of the model. So it's not that we calibrate the not reduced matrix and then perform the redu reduction, which will eventually destroy the calibration. It is that we view the reduced matrix as the model and we try to find the best parameter, for example, the best parameter alpha, such that the reduced matrix achieves the, the best result. So if we interpret the uh, factor reduction as an inherent part of the model, uh, then this problem, this question here, yeah. so how close is the factor reduced matrix to the original one? This question is maybe not relevant. Yeah, but the remark, uh, you have to ask if you have enough factors to accurately represent the movements that are suitable for your, for your problem. Implementation and performance, we had this in the previous session. 
the factor reduction, eigenvalue decomposition, this is a time consuming algorithm. Therefore, I use uh, caching. So I calculate the reduction once, yeah, and only if the parameter changes, we need to recalculate this. And if you like to see what's going on, um, you can you can maybe start here in our factor matrix experiment and just have a look at the function factor reduction, which we used here, that this function actually does what we did. So I'm using here the Apache common math library. So the first step is to calculate the factor matrix. So the factor matrix is calculated with either a singular value decomposition or an eigenvalue decomposition. Then I sort the eigenvalues according to their size. So I compare the value. So what I create is a set of sorted indices. So then I take here the index of the largest and then second largest and so on eigenvector. And I built here this matrix. So the matrix square root of the eigenvalue multiplied with the eigenvector. So this is the eigenvector matrix. I also have this convention that the sign of this vector is determined by the first element. So therefore you have here the sign. And this is here my factor matrix F. That was this subroutine, which gives me the factor matrix reduced to this number of factors. So this is the candidate. What I then do is I do the renormalization of the rows. Yeah, So I calculate here the norm of each row and then I divide each row by, uh, yeah, this is the norm squared by the square root of this norm squared. Yeah, that's that's it. So that was our little experiment and that was it for today. Thanks.